Hello and welcome to Learn Spanish a la Boricua. It's time for class. Today we are reviewing the conversation we had in the previous episode, episode 15, where I had one of my best friends who started off as a language partner on the episode and we talked about our process as language partners. I highly recommend you view today's episode on YouTube. It has been my experience in the language process, and I know this is the case for many of my students, that until I see a word written down, it does not exist in my brain. You can say it to me 10 times, especially if it's a word that has a couple syllables, a little bit longer. You can say it to me 10 times in a row. 30 seconds later, I'm going to be like, what was the word? What was that? Until I see it written down, it just does not get in there. If that's the case for you and you know it, and yet, instead of watching the episode or taking time to write things down, you're just listening to it in the background, then you're not helping yourself, right? You're, you're here because you want your Spanish to get better. Then actually do the work because otherwise you're just wasting time. You're listening to this and just wasting your time because you're not actually learning, retaining, and progressing from it. So take the time. If you listen to this episode in the background because that's what you can do today, that's fine. But put 20 minutes on your calendar later on in the week for you to sit down and go back. If you've listened to it once, you don't need to listen to me even go through this whole friggin' spiel again. Just fast forward to the part where I have the vocab and you can then take notes on what I've gone over. All right. You are here again to improve your Spanish and hopefully you're, you've come to me because I've done it. I've, I'm not a native Spanish speaker. Nobody even spoke Spanish to me as a kid. I don't even have the benefit of having some sort of memory of what I used to hear, what sounds right. I did it all from freaking scratch. And this is how I did it. I'm not here to sell you bullshit. I'm not here to just get your money. I'm doing this podcast for free. And I'm telling you straight up what it takes to become bilingual. It takes you doing the work. And this is really a good <laughs> for me to set for the episode because I get a little soapboxy in here since the, the, the topic of the episode was language partners. All right. Well, we'll come back to that. I'm going to, voy a bajarle, voy a bajarle un poco. And the way that I suggest you work through this, this podcast depends on your level. If you're super beginner, start with the class first, then go back to the conversation episode. If you're a little bit further along and you can, you know, pretty well follow the episode, then the conversation, then start with that one. We are working on those transcripts. I'm thinking that next week we'll get Patreon open and we'll have um, quite a few already ready to go from previous episodes. All right. So stay tuned. Today is, I'm recording this on Juneteenth. All right, next week is when we're looking at getting the Patreon page launched and posting at least a, a good chunk of the transcripts. I don't believe that we'll have all seven ready to go at that point, but you have quite a few you can work back through. Any other PSA? I don't think so. Let's do the dang thing. Okay, so this episode with this beautiful lady right here, my friend Kelly, uh, all right, you would have heard me said in would have heard me say in the beginning of the episode that when I uh, messaged Kelly to start planning this and we were you know sort of compartiendo, sharing ideas, uh, getting prepped for what we wanted to talk about, I was walking around the apartment that night. Y caí en cuenta, caí en cuenta, which is like I realized, but you hopefully already have another verb. For to realize in your brain. It's not realizar. Realizar means to perform or to carry out something. It's kind of formal. It's like I need to, you need to perform a COVID test before. That was like where I heard realizar all the time. Because remember, I moved here in the pandemic. So, eh, eh, cualquier paciente debe realizar una prueba de COVID antes de, it's very formal, realizar. That does not mean, that's not, that does not mean Eso no significa realize. Realize you might know as darse cuenta. If you don't already have this phrase, you need it. Write it down. Darse cuenta. You hear the say? That means it's reflexive. We're going to look at the differences. There is a subtle difference between these two phrases. Darse cuenta is going to be the much more common one for to say, to realize. And we'll talk about why when we look at the translation of caer en cuenta. Yeah, right. I realize what the feel is of it, the subtle difference. But the difference grammatically is that darse cuenta is a reflexive verb. I talk about them every episode. Somebody had asked in the WhatsApp group that we have how to access those that reflexive verb class that I've mentioned. It is via the platform that I that I have, Spanish with Carrie on Kajabi. 
uh, which looks like this. We have monthly speaking challenges. I teach the topic of the challenge the first Tuesday of the month. And then all month long, people practice that skill and they do speaking assignments that you get better at the most important part of the language, speaking. Okay, let's go to the resource section. That's where you'll see that I have an entire library of recorded live classes about different topics. It's 25 bucks a month. Okay, you could even sign up for a month and, you know, just take some of these classes if you wanted to, that's fine. You know, I'm doing a lot of work for you guys in this podcast. So the well, least you can do is sign up for, just throw me 25 bucks, you know what I'm saying? But for real. Okay, so here we are. Look, I've got pronunciation tips. I've got a whole bunch of videos here on the process and giving you guidance on how to structure your process of learning the language. Ser, estar, gustar, encantar. Reflexive verbs. I have maybe three or four live classes about reflexive verbs. Okay, masculine and feminine. Direct and indirect object. Don't know what the heck that means. I didn't either before I decided I wanted to learn a second language, right? So click on the class and you know what? I go over what the heck they are and how the heck to use them. You don't have to come in with previous knowledge. I tell you what you need to know about them in the class, hence why it's a class, okay? Vocab, tips for working with language partners, which we'll go over in this class. Better said, a subjunctive, Puerto Rican Spanish, Puerto Rican lessons, all sorts of things, okay? So that's where you'll find in the platform that I use where I teach live classes, where you have monthly speaking challenges for you to work on it whenever you damn please. You don't have to be available for the live class, but you can, at three o'clock in the morning, decide that you're going to work on your Puerto Rican Okay, and the challenges, the live classes, you also have this resource section with a whole bunch of recorded classes that I've done. So check that out. The link is in the podcast description. All right, so the difference being that dar sequente is reflexive. That means that you always need the reflexive pronoun. What's a reflexive pronoun? It's what you're looking at here in bold. Me, te, se, nos, and se. Okay, we use with reflexive verbs. Me di cuenta. Put these all in past tense because I mean, we certainly use this phrase in present tense. I realize, but you might often use it in past tense. I realize. So here we have, I realized, you realized, he, she, or usted realized, we realized, they, or y'all realized. Me di cuenta, te diste cuenta, se dio cuenta, nos dimos cuenta, se dieron cuenta. All right, caer en cuenta. Grammatically is not reflexive. Don't use the me. Me caí means I fell. Okay, so it's not reflexive here. Me caí, I fell. Here, caí en cuenta, caíste en cuenta, cayó en cuenta, caímos en cuenta, cayeron en cuenta. Otra vez. I realize, you realize. He, she, usted realize. We realize, they or y'all realize. Caer en cuenta. The subtle difference, and I'm so glad that I found this phrase. For me, caer en cuenta has a little bit more of a sudden realization feel. It dawned on me is what somebody offered as a translation as I was looking around. And I feel like that is exactly what I needed to help explain this. Darse cuenta, like I said, is going to be more common, just like it would be more common for us in a lot of times to say, I realized really casual. Like I realized my time was better spent doing this for me and my business, right? I realized my time was better spent doing this. I realized that I kind of needed to give myself a structure for learning Italian. I realized I will always oh, be darse cuenta. Me di cuenta, me di cuenta, me di cuenta. I realized, I realized, I realized. Okay, this situation, when I, this context, when I was talking about, I was walking around the house and it was literally like, I stopped in my tracks and went, holy shit, obvious. she was my first freaking Puerto Rican Spanish teacher. Of course she has to be on that. That is a good moment for caer cuenta. It was like, it dawned on me. So I wanted to give you that, Say you will absolutely that phrase you will absolutely absolutely hear native speakers use it, but that segmenta will be more common for just your general I realize type statements. This is a it dawned on me is like nah, like I said, just ideal translation. Okay. More general realization. Correct. Let's keep going. Here we are. This was the second, maybe. No, this must have been the first year that I met Kelly in PR, and we went up to Rincón. We did a little uh, tour up the West Coast. We ended up in Rincón and El Faro, the, the lighthouse. And here we are at a restaurant in Quebradillas that had 
the best mofongo. Some of the best mofongo. Some of the best mofongo. Okay, uh, vocab. Actualmente vivo in Massachusetts. So this is Kelly. When she was giving her intro introduction about herself, she said, actualmente vivo in Massachusetts. Actualmente does not equal actually. Let me say that again for the people in the back. Actualmente does not mean actually. It is the only of the mente endings that is a false friend, a false cognate. It looks like something that it doesn't mean. Normally, if you don't know already, your mente endings are translate to an L-Y. So these are uh, adverbs. Totalmente is totally. Especificamente is specifically. Basicamente, basically, definitivamente. Definitely, exactamente, exactly, absolutamente, absolutely. This is not actually. Why? Because actual means current. Actual in Spanish means current. So actualmente means currently. She said, currently, I live in Massachusetts. Not actually. Currently, I live in Massachusetts. El actual presidente de los Estados Unidos. The current President, that's what that means. Actual will usually go before uh, the noun it's describing. De hecho is the phrase that you need when you want to say actually. Actually, we're going to go there tomorrow. De hecho, vamos para allá mañana. De hecho, that's the phrase you need for actually. Do not use actualmente because you will be saying currently. Please write that down. Number one mistake. Maybe not number one, but it's up there. Top 10. All right, then we're gonna get into some of the phrases. The vocab's kind of short in this section because I'm, like I said, I have a soapbox to get on. Here's a, a trip that we did. We went on a bike trip in Salinas, a bike tour. Uh, it was Salinas, see. And with her daughters, me and Kelly, uh, it was hilarious. We were riding, there were all these fiddler crabs. You know, so they've got like the one big crawl, the one big crawl, <laughs> there's so many of them. And you have to like, dodge them you know at the beginning the tour guide said please don't try to intentionally crush them like some people think that's a fun game to just run over these things quite the opposite you have to try as hard as you can to not crush them these bitches are everywhere coming across the street like ar, ar, ar. I mean, not the street the sand um it was very hilarious it reminded me of the nemo crabs which i think were the brooklyn accent ones <laughs> Hey, hey. Okay, back to your scheduled program. Me puso el primer audio. I said this to her. I said this when I was talking about how Kelly and I started, once we transitioned from that, the website that we met each other on, which was italki, which no longer lends itself to finding language partners. I've tried to go on and double check because I'm always looking for things to recommend to students. And now it looks like it's only set up for finding classes that you can book with people, um, which was Fine, that's a good way to do speaking practice as well, to practice with a tutor or a teacher. But if you're looking specifically for Puerto Rican Spanish, there's not that many teachers on there, I believe, from PR. You know, because I've looked. So uh, we met each other there, then we started chatting on WhatsApp. And I am saying here that she played the first audio I ever sent her. And in that audio, every three words, and you can say this in English, was, is that how I say it? Is that right? I had zero confidence in my ability to put things together in Spanish. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, but I wanted to point out to you, you might know the verb poner as to put. It has quite a few meanings, especially when it's reflexive, like ponerse, me puso, me pongo nerviosa. I get nervous. That's a whole thing for you to look into. But poner is also the right verb to use to play or to put on music. Okay, it was something that I was like, how do I say it? he played this song for me or something? I wanted to say she played the audio, me puso el audio is the is the correct thing here. And that's poner in the past tense. Okay. Uh, if your phone is in Spanish, you would say, Oye Siri, pon miradas raras por el audio carrión. Oye Siri, pon miradas raras por el audio carrión. Que pon is the command form of poner. I'm telling her to do this action. Play. Play miradas raras by Eladio Carrion. Confused about por y para? Well, we happen to have a challenge on that where you will learn all the differences and practice them all month long by coming up with sentences yourself so that it's actually real and sticky to your brain. All that on this and more 
on the Spanish with Carrie platform. Okay, another one that she said, which is so common here in PR, con todo y, con todo y, de, con todo y eso is the one we're looking at right now, but you'll also hear this in other contexts and in, in some lyrics. I don't think I'm going to go there right now because the context of the lyric that's coming up is not the cleanest. Con todo y eso. And yet, even then, even so, nevertheless, that's the feel. Okay, I'm going to give you the context of this, where this came up. She was, we were talking about how we corrected ourselves. Our, our form of correcting ourselves was different, whether you're doing, just listening to someone's audio, excuse me, whether you're on the phone with somebody or whether you're there in person with somebody, okay? Uh, here she's talking about maybe on the phone, right? We, on the phone, we would correct each other, but of course, like we try to keep the flow of the conversation going so it wasn't, uh, as much of a pause to stop and explain things. We're trying to keep the, the flow of the conversation. So she says, Pero con todo eso, uno como native speaker a veces deja los pequeños detalles pasar. Uh, so even, even then, even so, but even then, right? One as a native speaker sometimes lets those little details pass by. Right, because that's that's the difference. Like an audio is so great because you have a lot of time to to respond to somebody to explain why it needs to be one way or the other, and that's just the dynamic of sending each other audios in a phone conversation or in person. Because you're working so hard to get things out on the spot, you sometimes let those little errors just let them go because you understand perfectly and you don't want to. It's just pull, completely take them out of there. I'm the the phrase coming up in Spanish. Sacale de, de, de orbita. But it like pulls you out of orbit that you completely get thrown off. That's what I said. You get completely thrown off by a correction when you're just trying so hard to get the freaking words out, right? So if Kelly says something like, uh, we were in our way to the market, and that's on our way. That's the one that Spanish speakers have a hard time learning. The difference was between in and on. In that moment, if she's already like, I can see she's struggling to just, she's really working hard. It's like, we're going to let that go, you know? So so that's what she's uh, referring to here. And that's that's certainly the case. Pero con todo eso. And yet, even so, nevertheless. Okay, bendito. <laughs> what she said here, bendito. Ay, dito. Right, dito is the other one that I say dito sometimes. So bendito, that's when she's talking about the the furthest or the most challenging example is you speaking on the spot, live face to face with somebody. Being there in that situation, she says, okay, bendito. Esta persona se está esforzando, this person's trying so hard, is working so hard, putting in so much effort to get the language out. We're not going to like the errors aren't the focus at that point when you have somebody in front of you and you already might feel like their nervousness or all of the gears turning whatever okay bendito right now your errors are not the most important thing and i understand what you're saying then we're just going to keep going because you're doing really well you're working so hard bendito, bendito. <laughs> okay another one that i said later when i was referring to how kelly corrects me on the spot when we're in person me consta que. I use that phrase. I think I even said me consta de que. You don't need de there. Mala mía. Me consta que. No hay nadie mejor que Kelly en corregirme, en su forma de corregirme. I am sure. I know for a fact that there is nobody better than Kelly in the way that she corrects me. She will simply just bop, say the right thing after I've said the wrong thing. And there is, it's just so... The timing of it, the energy of it, it's perfect. It's just what I need. Most of the time she knows, like when I was in that space too, I was already, very, I knew the, the rules very well, but you know, you speaking in the on the spot, there's so much going on in your brain. You're trying to recall words, you're putting everything together. That means that some of the things, and you're trying to get it out in a timely manner, which means you mess up on things that you already know. So there was times where I would make a mistake and I'd already be like, oh, I feel like, and she would just confirm the right way to say it afterwards by throwing in, in the correction right there. So that was the, the context that that came from. But the phrase being me consta que, it means you would use it like this, me consta, is I know. That's why the me is there. Uh, you would have to change it to te or le or something if it was going to be for somebody else. Okay. 
All right, now it's time for me to get on my soapbox. I have met with hundreds of Spanish students over the past three years. And that's not an exaggeration. The number one thing they tell me is, it's the speaking. I can understand pretty well. I like, no, blah, 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 but it's the speaking, it's the speaking, it's the speaking, it's the speaking, speaking. Unless you're a beginner, then it's everything. If you're a beginner, it's everything. And I, it's an important distinction to make. I have some ambitious beginners who are ready to, and this has been the case for years, that are ready to do conversation practice. I hate to burst your bubble. It's going to be really damn hard to have a conversation when you know 50 words. I have no delusions about trying to have a conversation right now in Italian. I can understand a lot of Italian because of its similarity to Spanish. Plus, that I know Spanish structure so well. So there's different tenses. There's things that I'm picking up that I'm observing and it's making sense to me. How much active vocab do I have? How much can I pull out on the spot and, and speak to somebody? Mm. If I understand, let's say my understanding in, in a certain thing that I'm reading is 80%. How much of that I'm able to pull out on the spot? 10, 15. It's my, I think I'm starting my third month of Italian. I don't have enough experience in the language yet to try to freaking have a conversation. Be realistic. Again, good luck having a conversation with 50 words. The estimate is that you need about 1,200 to 2,000 words to have a frustrated conversation. To have the kind of conversation where you have to keep finding a different way, a more basic kind of not exactly what you want to say way to say things. 2,000 words that are in your active vocabulary. That's not somebody speaking to you. Yeah, you got to be able to understand that also. P.S. Important part of under, of conversation is, is having enough experience in the language, enough time in the language that you have a fairly good level of understanding. Okay. But th that you can come up with those words. That you can pull those out on the spot. Active vocab. So if you're... At the beginner side, beginner, intermediate, if you don't even know past tense yet well enough to say, hey, how was your weekend? And then speak about how your weekend was in past tense. It's not time to do conversation practice. You're still building. You're doing a lot of building at this point. Keep listening, add more vocab, get a couple more tenses under your belt. That is okay. If you're intermediate, you've got quite a few tenses in your toolbox. You know that you are not a beginner as far as vocab goes. And you are in this frustrated place of, I just can't get the words out. You need to be speaking. The only way you get better at speaking is by doing it over and over and over and over and over and over again. And a lot of people will avoid this because it's uncomfortable, because you're afraid you're going to make mistakes, because it's really uncomfortable, to be honest, to get on the phone with somebody you don't know that well and try to struggle through in your second language. And maybe you're not going to understand all the things that they say to you. And maybe they're not going to understand what it is you're trying to say. Guess what? It's just discomfort. You won't die. You won't die from being uncomfortable. Get over it. Okay. You have to be willing, when I talk about the two circles of language learning, all the shit that you have to learn, which I'm talking about my, my beginners, you have to learn vocab, you have to learn tenses, you have to be able to put all those things together in the spot in order to get to a place for your conversation. That's one circle. The other one is getting out of your own way, okay? Being uncomfortable is not going to kill you. Get over it. It's just uncomfortable. If you're intermediate and struggling to speak and you're not practicing speaking about three times a week, what are you doing? You're just perpetuating the level that you're at and deciding that, you know, I'm, I'm doomed to be here because I can't get out of my own way. If you, if, if it's a different situation, if it's more of a time thing, if you are a mom of two to five-year-olds, whatever, babies to five-year-olds, if you are working full-time and you're also going through school, it's just probably not the best time for you to take this on because you need to have the time to dedicate to it. And if you don't, then it's not the best time to take this on. If you do, and you know that instead of practicing, you're like, well, I'll just do Duolingo because at least I did something. You're not actually doing the work that you need to do to get better. Then what are you doing? You're wasting your time. You might be wasting your money too. And you need to practice speaking a lot. That's, that's the, not only from me, from the guy I follow, Ali Richards, who knows like eight some languages fluently, uh, says the only way to get better at speaking is by doing it over and over and over again. You have to speak a lot, 
a lot to get better at speaking. Okay. And you have to speak consistently because if you drop off for a certain amount of time, you lose it. All right. So I'm pushing you guys to look for someone to practice. If you're in the WhatsApp group and you're not participating and you're not trying to see if anybody uh, can practice with you, what are you doing? What are you doing? You might be taking up space. I'm trying to keep the balance decent with between native Spanish speakers and native English speakers. If you're a native English speaker and there or a native Spanish speaker, and you're not actually taking advantage of that space to practice, then you're taking that space away from somebody who might actually do the work. Cause I'm saying, hold on right now. We need to watch the balance. So I'm not admitting more people. And in. instead you're taking up space in that WhatsApp without actually using it. Don't do that. Uh, okay. When I, something I mentioned and again with the audio, that the first audio that I sent to her and how she later showed that to me. And it's like, good Lord, how annoying. Is that right? Is that what I say? Is that my hands? That was me. Because I had no confidence, I was out of practice. I was not practicing. Uh, so I had a lack of confidence about how to put things together in Spanish. Well, by simply going through the process, by starting to speak more to somebody and by having them speak to you, you gain a ton of confidence in your ability to put things together. You start to go, yes, this is the right way to say that. Yes, I can. And that little bit of confidence opens up a ton of the language for you. One of the biggest things, we just had this conversation over the weekend in the WhatsApp chat, doubt is one of your biggest enemies in the language because the more anxious or doubtful you're feeling about yourself, the more you're actually blocking yourself brain chemistry wise in of being able to get the language out. Uh, that's what anxiety does to our brain. It makes us so that basic things we, we can't do, you know? Um, so you, there's a real, I think that confidence in the language is completely underrated. Um, you having a little bit more confidence in that, yes, I can say things this way opens up the your brain to the all of the things that it has in it versus creating this block, this barricade between you and all the knowledge you have. So just the practice of speaking more, practicing with somebody, seeing that, yes, this is right, yes, they understand me, allows you to flow better. Right? One benefit of having a language partner. Number two, people often imagine that travel or their romantic partner is going to be the time where they practice, okay? These might not be the best time to practice the language, okay? If you're, I think that the common mistake people make in traveling is that they think about all the things that they'll need to say, but they don't practice really listening that part. So they say what they need to say and someone responds to them, they have no idea what the person said. And then in that case, especially in Puerto Rico, they're just gonna switch back to English with you. Most people here, they'll, they'll find somebody that does. There's plenty of people that, that have enough Spanish, to enough English to get by. And that's what they're going to do. You're not going to be able to speak in Spanish because they're just going to switch to English. Even if they might not even give you the chance, depending on where you are, from San Juan, you might speak to them in Spanish and they just respond to you in English right away. Why? Because they probably had so many gringos come to them that say, I know how to say, quiero una cerveza. But then when the waiter responds to them, they don't understand jack shit. And then the, that waiter, have, having gone through that experience, you know, 500 times, is no longer interested in you trying to practice there. I'm serving you right now. I have other tables. I have other shit to do. I'm not your language teacher. I am bringing you food. You have to understand me when I'm speaking to you. So the, the misconception that travel is a good place for you to practice, not always, right, depending on your level. Um, and your partner. Let's talk about native speakers and why it can be hard for them to be a good language partner. Number one, if it's your partner, again, just like with a, a waiter or somebody in a rental car place, they are not probably, you, unless you guys set aside a certain amount of time, we're going to do half an hour of, of trying to practice in this time. And I'll, I'll talk about something that I've kind of had prepared. That's a great way to do it. But often with your partner, you have transactional stuff to do. You have coordinating, coordination uh, to do. You have uh, plans to make and, and things that need to be clarified. And if your the language is holding you back, it's not realistic for, or you, you can't get those things out or you can't express them well, it's not going to happen really uh, with your partner. Also, if you have been with this partner for a while and your relationship, your connection is established in English, it's gonna be hard to switch your relationship to Spanish. 
you'll find that it feels weird to do that. So, uh, and the other thing is that native speakers, I know I'm talking about language partners with native speakers, but at least people that are in the language uh, partner business or looking for that, they're also learning English and they have maybe some, just like learning Spanish gives you a lot of insight on your own language and how you speak it, vice versa. They might be going through the process and have some sort of feedback on Spanish based on that. However, typically we as native speakers are not very good at explaining our language. Tell me why, you who's listening right now, why is it right to say I called him and not I called he? Because it's right, right? Is that your answer? Because it's right? Because I called him is the right one to say. Why? I don't know, right? I do know. I do know it's because him is the direct object pronoun and he is a subject pronoun. He does the action. Him is the direct object. That means that the action is done to that, to him. Okay. So, but would we be able to, would I have been able to explain that if I didn't teach Spanish grammar? If I hadn't have uh, literally dedicated myself to language? Hell no. Somebody once, one of my language partners once asked me the difference between when to use maybe or might. I told her I thought that maybe was like the halfway point between yes and no. You're going to go tonight? Maybe. And then might is more for possibilities. She turned around and said, okay, well, as when I was first here, she's like, maybe you can get a job at the at this place. She's like, should that be might? You might, might, maybe you get. And I was like, nope, maybe is perfectly correct. Screw everything I just told you. I don't know. We do this thing into these things intuitively. We do them without thinking. We do that without ever having been asked why or th thought about why. We just open our mouth and the words come out correctly. Okay, so native speakers might not be the best resource for you in explaining some things. With your language partner, you'll get corrected. They know intuitively when you're wrong or right. Just like we know, we hear, I saw he, that it's I saw him. There's no place where we would let that fly. But could we explain to you why it needs to, when to use one or the other? No, that would be really hard for most native speakers. Okay, so give your partner a break. They might not have the rules to be able to explain them to you. They just know them intuitively. So that's why it's good for you to get on Spanish with Carrie platform because I explain the rules to you. <laughs> All right, other benefit of having a language partner, again, that you might not find with in traveling or with your romantic partner is empathy and patience. Okay, somebody who is also struggling to get the words out of their being in English is going to understand where you're at when you're super slow in Spanish. They're going to empathize. They're there too. They're going to also know the feeling of just give me a second. The word's in there and I need to find it. And if you tell me the word, then I'm not getting better at that process of recalling them. So give me a second to find it. They're not going to really cut in and, and say the word for you, right? Give me a moment. I just need to find the word. All I wanted people to do when I was at that place of being so slow was just give me the freaking, just give me the time. I know it's there. I have to find it on my own. You do it for me. You're not helping. Okay. They have patience. Therefore, they have patience for you to find those words, to work through it, to know that you're going to make mistakes and whatever. That's something you find here that you're not going to find generally in life. People that you find por ahí might not have the empathy nor the patience to deal with where you're at in the language part, in the language process. So find yourself a language partner. Okay. Lastly, <clears throat> We talked about this in in the episode, and again, I want to re uh, reiterate because I think it's incredibly important, and also for more beginners that might have missed some of the details. At the beginning, I feel like for the first year, pretty solidly, we got on the phone once a week. We did a half an hour in Spanish and a half an hour in English. As Kelly said in the episode, the time that you spend in each language should be según el nivel de vocabulario, because she knows because she's bilingual now, right? According to your level of vocab, según, according to the level of vocab that you have, right? Again, what I mentioned in the beginning, if you have 50 words, good luck having a conversation. If you have more vocab, and so does the person that you're practicing with, you might be able to, to push through a half an hour of speaking 100% in Spanish, 100% in English. Don't switch back in between. You're not going to find the flow. It helps when someone, when the native speaker is speaking to you in Spanish, you'll find that it gets easier for you to speak. Hearing it makes it easier to produce it. I talked about that in the episode, if I didn't edit it out. I can't remember. The episode started out being like 40 minutes. So I cut it down to 25. One thing I mentioned was that before getting on the phone with Kelly, I would always listen to a podcast in Spanish before, even if it was 15 minutes, because just hearing the language helped my brain start to get in the place of thinking in Spanish. So that's the same case when you're live on the phone. If they're speaking to you, you end up 
being able to flow a little bit better in the language. If they keep switching back to English, you will as well. This is why also practicing with your bilingual partner is not the greatest idea. If you, because you want them to speak to you in Spanish, maybe, and you might end up uh, for slowness, or for, you know, for sake of quickness, responding back in English, then they're going to switch to English because it's harder to continue to respond in the language you're not hearing. Sometimes I come home and I'm, or whatever, I'm here, I've been here all day by myself and I'm, my brain is default in English. Alfredo comes home, you know, the first couple of things I say to him in English, he speaks back to me in Spanish. We end up speaking Spanish because after he continues to respond to me in Spanish, just that's the language that takes over. My brain goes, those words that you're using, I'll just repeat them within my response, it's easier. So uh, the switching is not helping you find your flow in the language. Stay for a certain amount of time in one language, stay for a certain amount of time in the other language. When the person, so when when Kelly and I were speaking in English, that's when it would be, I would give her all my updates in Spanish, right? So here's what's happening, here's what happened the other day, blah, blah, blah tell a story, this, that, she'd respond to that, then it'd be like, okay, now your turn, tell me what's up. Now we're in English and you have to speak more. So that would be her time to, to do her updates. We sent each other audios like almost daily. We were in touch all the time in messages. Um, we just, we clicked very quickly. So it was easy to as well. We became friends pretty quickly. Um, okay, I wrote down my correction. I'd like to pull out this notebook and would review and rewrite. I would review and rewrite my corrections weekly. So let's take a look here. Uh, I have, 78 pages of notes in Spanish uh, from over the years. So it's probably over about two to three years. And I would use this as my, this was like my Bible of corrections and of vocab and, and all sorts of things of phrases that I learned, phrases from podcasts, phrases from my different language partners, phrases from lessons I was taking, phrases from things I read, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, and then I would take out a loose leaf piece of paper and I would rewrite my notes here. So I would say, I would write down that day. All right, today I did pages 22 to 24. Those were the ones that I reviewed. I would look at them and I would rewrite down the phrases that I just don't think that seeing them is enough for them to actually get in. Just looking at the words and going, okay, yeah. I would say them out loud, but for me, I needed to write them down. So I'd rewrite everything on those couple pages. And then the next week when I would come back to this practice, I would pick up, all right, so that, that last time I did pages 22 to 24, now I'm gonna do page 25, whatever, if I have a short amount of time, I could just do one page, but I rewrite, I rewrite. And I would have the memory, let me say, let me look at the conversation here. Can I see him Okay. Uh, I remember, I remember. Exactly. So the first business that I tried to create, I was, uh, well, first I did mindfulness and movement classes for kids. And then I tried to do coaching based on mindfulness and meditation. Uh, and we were talking about needing business cards, me having business cards or no, or not, you know, my, my, coming into the business world and having to put myself out there, having to go up to people. I went to a health fair and, you know, saying like to not, to not inconvenience them, to not make them feel uncomfortable. I have all that there. And it's anchored in a memory from my real freaking life <laughs> from when I really tried to create my first business and that fair that I went to. And I remember exactly what I had ready there for people, a little sign up sheet, what I was talking to them about, all the emotions that went on with that event. And I talked to Kelly about it afterwards. And it's all, I truly believe that you retain better when these things are anchored in real memory. It's not a list that you're trying to learn from a podcast. Okay. It's something that you actually talked about with your language partner from that time in your life. And that there is no better way to make language real and personal and part of your personality than to anchor it in your own life and your own memories. So I think that this was an incredibly important piece of my study was reviewing those corrections and those conversations in order for these things to become more vivid in, in my brain. I worked my ass off 
to learn this language. That's why I keep getting on you guys about doing the work because what what's attractive out there is the people that tell you that you can be fluent in three months. It's attractive because people don't want to think about the amount of work it takes to really get to this level, but it's bullshit. All you're doing is spending money on something that's not gonna work. People, they're salesmen, they're sales people. The people that are selling you that you can learn it in three months, whatever that you can do to learn it the lazy way, this or that. They want to get your money. Of course, they're going to tell you that their product works. It effing doesn't. Only a savant, a, a someone has a photographic memory can learn to be fluent in that amount of time. It takes so long for you to build the amount of vocab that allows you to talk about just about anything. And it takes so much work, consistent work. Uh, let's see. That's what I just went over. Okay, let's talk about it's normal. What's normal? Hold on a second, friends. I really wanted this to be a gradual entry. Let's go. It's normal to have bad language days. I mentioned that in the podcast. I said that part in English because that was the 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 language that this in concept was introduced to me in. Bad language days, where some days you're just tired, you have a hard time getting the words out, you feel like your accent is stronger, you're not understanding, you can't recall vocab. It's normal to have bad language days. It'll normally happen on days when you're tired and you haven't really gotten enough rest. But what Kelly said in the in the podcast, si descanso, si no descanso, descanso if I rest, if I rest, if I refuse or not. It's normal to burn out. I, I said that I see this in my students que se van fundiendo. Fundirse is what you use for like a light bulb when it burns out, okay? Uh, to have limited tolerance in the language. When I was first here, I think that my, my limit for Spanish was about four hours. I could do four hours, 100% interacting and listening to Spanish. Obviously, since then, my capacity has grown quite a bit. I could be days in Spanish and, and be okay, okay? Would I be able to be days in Spanish if it was a physically or mentally, emotionally exhausting situation? No, that would be hard. If I were to do El Camino de Santiago, that, that hike that goes through Spain, you know, you can start in France and, and I was in Spanish every single day and hiking, you know, 20 miles a day or something. I might, I might get exhausted. You know, you're physically tired and your brain's like, oh, I feel like my English is affected from being really tired. My mom and I typically did speak to each other in the morning when I was a kid because she's not a morning person and neither was I. And the brain was like, not, no, no conversation at this hour. Right. So it's not very normal, very normal for you to have sort of a, a drop off point. To not feel like yourself, to not have a sense of humor so hard. Oh, humorous timing. That's what I said in the episode. Kelly was talking about this. You know, she wants to be able to just throw out a little joke there with her compañeras de trabajo, her coworkers. And yet, by the time you formulated the joke, the time has passed. That's what happens. Humor is quickness. And it takes a long time to get to that level of quickness in the language. The only way that you get there by doing it over and over again, putting yourself on the spot, speaking in that moment, getting quick reproducing producing things in the moment. It's normal to be nervous. You're gonna be nervous, do it anyway, right? It's the same with being uncomfortable, so what? I truly think that, you know, I told you my first business was uh, mindfulness and, and, and based in meditation. I feel like meditation was key to me being able to get to where I am in language or getting over that first year of it being so uncomfortable to get back in and to fail all the time at speaking, to not always understand, whatever. The discomfort of it, what what meditation teaches you is like, here's an emotion, uh, let it go. Here's something, let it go. Here's the thought, not now. Here's, that's what you do. Sit down. Don't make meditation this frou-frou thing. I hate that. Sit down. You do 10 minutes of watching your brain go, oh, but what about this? And you say, not right now. If you have a practice of doing that for 10 minutes a day, then you in life get better at saying that bullshit, not right now, okay? Oh, I'm nervous, I can let that go. This is here, we're gonna let that go. I'm anxious, blah, 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 too bad, get over it. Like you just get better at discerning what kind of thoughts you need to pay attention to. And the idea that I'm nervous so I shouldn't practice or I'm gonna make a mistake so I shouldn't practice, you end up feeling like that's, that's actually, those are thoughts that are me getting in my own way and me blocking me from getting to where I wanna go. You get better at releasing those things. 
I think meditation is really important. I thought about um, how language learning can be different depending on your personality. For people that are naturally anxious, it's much harder. For people that are naturally introverted, much harder. I am an extrovert in every sense of the word. Being around people gives me energy. That's why I love to be, that's why I love to teach. Okay, I'm like, give me all of your energy, okay? It would be so hard, so much harder as an introvert, right? It doesn't even occur to you to speak up in English in your native language. How hard? I like, I'm so freaking chatty. I was dying to talk more. Well, let me tell you about the shit that you probably don't even care about. I'm dying to, you know, that's my nature. Okay, so uh, if you're anxious, you might want to consider a meditation for your life and for learning a language. It gets you better at letting that shit go. It's normal for your language partners to be flaky. So Kelly was the person that I ended up having a, a best friendship with. Okay, but I had about seven language partners over the course of three years. Uh, I had, and, and, and one that I still keep in touch with here and there, he's Peruvian. Uh, him, I had Kelly, I had another Puerto Rican uh, girlfriend that I would practice with who she and I practiced on and off for like two or three years. She was a very consistent one and we would we would also talk every week. Um, I had a, a Spain Spanish gal that I practiced with for a little bit and a Spain Spanish guy who was in the beginning of quarantine um, that I practiced with him for a little bit as well. He had a lot of time and so did I. And I was like, fantastic. That was a thing with one, like for me, I knew that I needed my, my goal was really to speak Spanish daily. Um, I knew that I needed a lot of frequency and that one person alone wouldn't be able to offer me the frequency that I needed to get better in the language. So I had multiple language partners. It's a good idea. If I, I went back to that slide of, of being an intermediate student, not being at the place where you can, where you're being at the place where you're frustrated because you can't really hold a conversation all that well, and yet you're not doing speaking practice. You should be doing speaking practice like three times a week. That's where you're going to notice a, a big progress. The more you do it, the quicker you progress. So if you do it every day, that was my, that was my philosophy. If I can speak Spanish every day, I'm going to notice a huge difference in two, three months. So I had multiple language partners to be able to do that. I had a friend, a guy who was Colombian that I practiced with for a while. So some of these people would fade in and out, right? Life circumstances change. One of these people gets a new job or they move and then they end up falling off because the move completely took over their schedule and they didn't get back to practicing their language afterwards. That happens. So that's why I've had all of these over the years so that I could keep myself consistent. And, you know, I, I'm persistent. I continue to... I would feel like I was usually the one that made the contact. Hey, can you practice this week? Hey, can you practice this week? Hey, whatever. You know, most people are going to be like, yeah, I really should. Most most people know on the other side, these Spanish speakers know that they need to practice their English. Maybe they're being a little bit lazy, uncomfortable, nervous. They are getting in their way in their own space, you know? And so if you give them that little nudge, like, yeah, you know what we really do, I totally do. That'll be the response, okay? So these things are normal, but you decide how much you let them prevent you from progressing. Get out of your own way and do the work. Um, I will link, Hello, like I said, Italki is the one that I used for a, to find a lot of those language partners that I just mentioned, not the greatest resource anymore. The, the platform has changed. So I'm going to link Hello Talk in the description of the podcast so you can get on and you can filter results on Hello Talk. Um, I should do this right now. Stay with me, friends. Actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to keep you guys on this. If you'd like to learn the best way to get results on HelloTalk, then stay with me for another moment, por favor. I'm going to go to here. Yes, I'm so proud of myself. I was like, I need to make a folder of these freaking screenshots. <laughs> and I did it. All right. So in HelloTalk, it'll look like this when you download it. This will be where all your chats. If you're a girl, you're going to get a ton of chats from men being like, wow, que sonrisa más bonita. Mm. Quieres hablar? You can talk about how beautiful you are. Okay. Just ignore that. Uh, go to the connect button instead. You can uh, be more picky about who you speak to. Then you're going to filter your results. You're going to go to region. You can pick Puerto Rico. Then once you click uh, on that and you, you do search, right? If you have a VIP membership, you could even pick the 
uh, gender, I think, of people that you want to practice with. But once you press search, once you have all these things, you can uh, look at this level of proficiency. So how if they are really proficient in English, you might not want to practice with them if you're more intermediate, because that means they're going to be able to switch to English with you all the time. And you're not forced to kind of struggle more in Spanish. So you might want them to be a little bit less proficient in English. Their native is Spanish. They're learning English, a little bit less proficient. You can choose from Puerto Rico. Then you press search. It's going to show you first Typically, when I did this last time in uh, with Italian, it showed, showed me new users right away, which is good. New users are getting on there and they're probably checking it. They've got, they haven't been letting the app sit on their phone for two or three years. Okay. So that's a good one. You'll also, it'll also show you serious learners when you, let me go over to this one. Look at this. Serious learners, you can pop over to that section. It'll show you people that are really there correcting others, right? Sharing corrections. Um, and et cetera, they're using the app to actually practice and the app knows that because it's all algorithm and how much of, how much of it they're, they're doing. So you can search by that way and you have to be consistent. I did this shuffle with language partners I did over two to three years. So, and it was a constant finding people when somebody would drop off, I'd go find another one. You might talk with somebody that it doesn't work out. Don't give up, you know, again, that's just you getting in your own way. There's somebody out here who is as serious as you are about needing to practice English. I promise you that. And um, you can find them. Just keep doing, putting in the work. I will put the link to Hello Talk in the description of today's podcast. I will put my platform link. It's always in there. You could also book a consult with me one-on-one, -on -one, half an hour to just chat about process, get some direction, help clarify one specific part of the language, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, friends, I think it was like an hour long episode. Dang. I'm passionate about this. Do the work. Get out of your own way.